subject of equal educational opportunity was such an important one and of such concern to all of us that we wanted to have a whole conference on it instead of just one speaker. And we would like, we wanted to involve the community at large instead of limiting it to law students. And so the idea of this conference evolved. We feel we received just a wonderful response from everybody we asked to participate. As a result, we have 13 really outstanding speakers and panelists here to speak to you today. And we are especially pleased with the response we received from you, the audience, because we think it's really wonderful that so many people are interested in this subject. And now, for a more official welcome, I'd like to introduce you to our Dean, Dean Richard Maxwell. Thank you. My thanks to you, <coughs> Joel, for what I know has uh, been a, an interesting but very uh, heavy uh, burden you carried in putting this uh, conference together. It's a pleasure, too, to get the law school involved in cooperation with the School of Education in a conference of this kind. The involvement of, of law students and lawyers with the problems of the day is, is becoming uh, one of the uh, great uh, landmark developments in legal education. Uh, not that uh, lawyers were not always so involved, but uh, I think it is only recently that the involvement has reached as far as it now does into legal education and into the life of the law student. I can't help but think that this may be one of the really significant developments in not only legal education but the legal profession as this century develops. My principal function here today is to introduce our keynote speaker, <coughs> the Honorable William L. Taylor. Taylor comes from a rigorous and distinguished educational background in Brooklyn College and the Yale Law School. His uh, professional career has uh, ranged from uh, government uh, activities as a very young man in New York to uh, uh, certainly the fascinating position of staff attorney for the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. Apparently was a lobbyist at one stage, uh, working uh, for Americans for Democratic Action. But uh, in 1961, uh, he found what certainly has been his most important career activity to date with the United States Commission on Civil Rights. He served with that commission uh, in various posts until 1965 when the president uh, appointed him to his present position, staff director of the commission, <coughs> where he has served ever since. It's amazing that during his very active legal career, he has managed to operate not only uh, as uh, an active uh, lawyer and administrator, but uh, uh, he has a, a publication list that would gladden the heart of a dean trying to get a professor appointed in the University of California. Uh, his, uh, his most uh, recent publication certainly has a, a title that, uh, that uh, stimulates uh, thought and perhaps even controversy. Uh, School Integration Still Makes Sense, published in September 1967. I think most of you are familiar uh, with the agency uh, that our speaker serves, the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights established in 1957. It had the uh, function of investigating uh, complaints that citizens were de being denied uh, uh, voting rights, 
Uh, it had the function of studying and collecting information <laughs> concerning legal developments uh, relating to equal protection. It had the function of appraising federal laws and policies with respect uh, to these subjects. It also reported to the Congress and made recommendations to the President. It's long been involved, the Commission has, in the problem of our conference today. Its most recent report was the, uh, on the racial isolation in the public schools. My colleague, Harold Horowitz, who you'll hear from later in the morning in mentioning some of our speaker's accomplishments, noted that uh, few people realize one side of the Commission's work. Prior to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and prior to the Title VI of that Act, which of course uh, denies federal support where discrimination exists, the Commission staff, by prodding and investigating and urging and and uh, doing all of the work that one has to do to move anything as ponderous as the administrative and executive and legislative machinery of the United States, uh, managed to bring many federal agencies and programs to the point where they were examining whether or not their grantees were engaging in discrimination. Uh, this at a time when there was not the specific legal barrier to such discrimination as exists today. Uh, Mr. Taylor was one of the key staff people in this difficult and pioneering uh, endeavor. So as keynote speaker for this conference, we could hardly find a more experienced <coughs> or more suitable person. It's a great pleasure and honor to present the Honorable William L. Taylor. Thank you very much, Dean Maxwell. Mr. Horowitz, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in your uh, generous introduction, it was also good to hear that, uh, that there may even be a home for homeless bureaucrats after their time is up. <laughs> I was uh, also pleased to hear the purposes of the conference reaffirmed. That we don't get too constant communication on the East Coast from the West Coast, but I have noted that uh, in past weeks you have uh, had here on the campus in one place or another an ex-congressman from uh, New York and a senator from Minnesota. And I, for a moment I thought perhaps I had inadvertently wandered into a new program uh, for uh, entitled Dropouts from the Great Society, <laughs> but uh, I gather not. Since we're going to be spending the day here discussing equal educational opportunity, uh, maybe it would be a good idea to uh, just talk for a minute about the function that uh, we expect public education to serve. Uh, Thomas Jefferson talking about the need for establishing a public educational system, said that the object was to bring into action that mass of talents which lies buried in poverty in every county for want of means of development, and thus give activity to a mass of mind which in proportion to our population shall be the double or the treble of what it is in most countries. And there have been additional definitions. Horace Mann talked about education as being the great equalizer of the conditions of men. Supreme Court, of course, in the school segregation cases uh, said that it is the principal instrument in awakening in the, in the child uh, cultural values and preparing him for later professional training. And a panel of educators not long ago talked about it as the great healer of social divisions. Uh, it really wouldn't be necessary to get into all of these definitions, except maybe as a mark of uh, erudition, uh, were it not for the fact that uh, some educators these days are rejecting them in one way or another. 
recognizing that the public school systems are not serving uh, any or indeed or all or indeed any of these purposes that were set out uh, instead of trying to deal with the failings uh, they and they instead have been redefining or attempting to narrow uh, the definition of the role of education and so you hear as you go around the country that uh, the school system, uh, which only has a child for a number of hours in the day, cannot be expected to overcome the handicap which is faced by uh, uh, most Negro children or children who come from uh, other uh, poor families. Uh, I hope that uh, in this conference today we can start by rejecting uh, this kind of uh, notion, which I think is simply an evasion seems to me that the purpose of American education from Jefferson's time to right until now has been to help young people to surmount the barriers of poverty and limited backgrounds and to enable them to develop fully and to become full participants in our society. And the tributes that are accorded to public education and that have been accorded over the years uh, stem largely from the fact that it has served this role so successfully for most Americans, Negroes as well as whites. So I think that the councils of despair that you, that you hear so frequently will be in order only if after having done everything that we can to create the conditions for success, we have failed. And today, in my judgment, there is no question that public education, it is public education which is failing the children uh, rather than the other way around. Uh, our commission uh, in carrying out survey that Dean Maxwell referred to, which uh, over a period of uh, 15 months at the request of the President, found uh, in going around the country abundant and distressing evidence of the ways in which the public schools are failing. Uh, in going around, we saw the overcrowded ghetto schools. We saw and we heard a confirmation that school systems and administrators were classifying children at a very early age and operating on the premise that the certain kinds of children have only a limited ca capacity to learn. Mm -hmm. We saw and heard about teachers who in one way or another were indifferent to the needs of children or unable to uh, communicate with them. And we discovered that uh, these were not simply uh, uh, incidents or uh, which were isolated or uh, horror stories from the pages of books by Elliot Shapiro or Jonathan Kozel or Herbert Cole, but really everyday reality for many thousands and thousands of uh, Negro children. And now in beginning to, uh, uh, to investigate and conduct similar inquiries here in this area of the country, uh, we are finding also that it's everyday reality for Mexican-American children as well. In this report, we were focusing primarily on public schools in the North and the, and the West, uh, where segregation exists, uh, but where it is not now compelled either by law or by official policy. And one of our major purposes in the study was to try to determine or to shed new light on the question of whether among all the, the factors that are important in the educational process, the segregation or isolation of children by race and social class was of significance. And our conclusion on this score, which I think is the central finding of the report, was simply that Negro children suffer serious harm wherever their education takes place in segregated public schools and whatever the source of the segregation may be. Uh, the report said, and the quote briefly from it, that Negro children who attend predominantly Negro schools do not achieve as well as other children, Negro and white. Their aspirations are more restricted than those of other children, and they do not have much, as much confidence that they can influence their own futures. When they become adults, they are less <coughs> likely to participate in the mainstream of American society and more likely to fear, dislike, and avoid white Americans. The conclusion drawn by the U.S. Supreme Court about the impact upon children of segregation compelled by law, that it affects their hearts and minds in ways unlikely to be undone, applies 
also to segregation not compelled by law. That's the end of the quote. Now, it's been interesting to me that uh, with uh, a few exceptions, there has not been a great deal of disagreement about the conclusion. Although some people would argue that the harm that occurs in segregated schools can be dealt with without attacking <coughs> segregation, the findings have been accepted by almost all who have commented in one way or another on our report. And they've been cited with uh, approval in a number of recent <coughs> court decisions, including the decision of uh, uh, Judge Skelly Wright in the case of Hobson versus Hansen uh, involving our, our school system in Washington, D.C. Uh, rather, the disagreement has centered on the Commission's recommendations, which in broad terms call for a, uh, an urgent effort through federal legislation, through state action, through community action, to integrate the schools as part of an overall program uh, to improve the quality of public education for all children. And while the language of the disagreement has varied, I think essentially it, there are two points that are being made. Uh, the first is that integration of the schools is a long-range, a visionary or impractical goal. And secondly, that the Commission's preoccupation with integration as a goal impliedly negates efforts to deal with the problem by other means, uh, described variously but uh, uh, through terms such as the creation of schools of excellence in the ghetto, which are more, in the judgment of the critics, more attainable. I think it's the second criticism that goes to the heart of the ma matter. And in order to evaluate it, I'd like to spend a few minutes going back to examine more closely the Commission's findings that segregation was harmful. There are two things that we found that were relevant here. One was the importance of the isolation of children by race and economic class uh, in the total process of education. And second, the special significance of racial isolation in our country and in our society. Uh, the relevance of the first factor, the composition of the student body to achievement, uh, is suggested by the maxim that students learn as much from each other as they learn from their teachers. Uh, students are influenced by the academic performance and the attitudes of their classmates. As they grow older, the influence uh, tends to grow stronger. Uh, a child who attends school with a majority of other children uh, who uh, start with, the, with values of academic su success, who do well in school, uh, for whom for college is a foregone conclusion before they even start, is more likely to come to share these values and to perform well than one who attends school with children who do not have great, these great <coughs> hopes for success and who tend to perform, therefore, poorly. Uh, this was one of the principal findings of what's referred to as the Coleman Report, which was a major survey done by the U.S. Office of Education uh, and involving some 650,000 children. It's also been suggested by the kind of experience we had in holding hearings and trying to find the facts. For example, I thought the process was really well illustrated uh, at a hearing we had uh, in New York and testimony we took about schools in Syracuse. Uh, there the president of the school board uh, explained to the commission why a group of children who came from low-income backgrounds did much better when they transferred from a school where all the children were similarly disadvantaged uh, to one where the children came from more prosperous backgrounds. And what he said was that the one junior high school, the disadvantaged school, if you cooperated with the teachers, if you did your homework, you were considered a kook. And at the other, the more advanced school to which they transferred, if you didn't cooperate with the teacher and if you didn't do your homework, you were a, a, a kook. And uh, he summarized it as saying that, that the peer pressure had a tremendous effect on the motivation and the motivation had an effect upon uh, achievement. Now, uh, this is not really a, a racial matter in any sense that we're talking about, uh, but it has some special significance uh, because uh, if only a small part of the 
of the Negro population or the Mexican American population is advantaged, uh, then if, if being in school with advantaged children is important, then uh, it, it, integration may come along with it. Uh, apart from this, we found that the impact, uh, uh, separate from the impact of, of uh, social class makeup, that the racial composition of schools had a specific additional effect on the attitudes and the performance of children. Uh, that disadvantaged Negro children tended to do better when they were in school with more advantaged ch children, but that specifically they did better in integrated schools. Why should this be? Well, Jim Allen, who was the superintendent of schools in New York, said it one way, and, and many people echoed what he said. He said that, that the all-Negro schools were looked on in most communities as being poor schools. <coughs> and no matter what you did to try to make them better in the minds of the white people in the community and the, as the community as a whole, they, were con they would continue to be regarded as poor schools. Uh, and we continued to hear that and to find evidence that children were sensitive to the views, that the views uh, were communicated to teachers and to administrative staff, that teachers communicated it to the students, and that this had an effect on their attitudes and upon their per performance. But some would ask, well, is this a necessary result? Uh, the advocates of an, of an all-out position of compensatory education argue that it is not. They say that if we can make the necessary investments in Negro schools, if we turn our attention to giving children a sense of pride, a sense of dignity, uh, we can build schools of excellence in the ghetto that will significantly improve education uh, for Negro children. And we did not suggest the opposite in this report. We found that uh, uh, existing programs of compensatory education had not resulted in significant uh, uh, improvement. Uh, this was basically through the data that, that was furnished by the school systems that engaged in the programs themselves. But in finding that, we did not say that if large-scale Im improvements are made in expenditures uh, for remedial techniques, that the results would not be better. But what do we mean when we talk about large-scale increases in the, for remedial techniques? Uh, the advocates of compensatory education uh, while discounting efforts to, to integrate as impractical, have not taken the trouble to spell out the implications of their proposed remedies or to demonstrate that they are practical. Uh, Commissioner Howe uh, had some light to shed on this subject in a speech he made at a conference we held a couple of months ago. He said if it's going to be genuine compensatory education, education that makes up for the failings of the home and for a, an entire heritage of failure and self-doubt, we're probably talking about massive per-pupil expenditures, about providing a great variety of special services ranging from health and psychological uh, care to remedial education efforts. We're talking about remaking the relationship between the school and the home and between school and employment opportunity. We're talking about identifying the, the, the person, the essential person who is in such short supply, the inspiring elementary school principal. We're talking about arrangements for retraining most teachers uh, and uh, for putting in, si in the city's uh, best and most experienced instructors into the schools in the ghetto, uh, which are now getting more than their share of uncertified and temporary teachers. We're talking about new curricula materials, some untried and yet to be developed, as well as revised methods of instruction. Particularly in the large cities of the East, we're talking about replacing school plants, which on the average are nearly a quarter of a century older than schools outside the city. And we're talking about doing all these things for families whose chil children are on the move, children in schools where the enrollment changes radically from year to year. Uh, one of the estimates of uh, uh, of the massive expenditures that might be involved in a genuine program of remediation uh, is that over the course of a 10-year period, we'd have to spend uh, 100 to $160 billion more uh, than we are currently spending for education. 
So given these facts, I think that uh, there's a real question about the political practicality of saying that we can move 180 degrees from a situation in which many legislatures and school boards uh, treat the ghetto school a step as a stepchild to one in which even with the assistance of the federal government involved, uh, they would be willing to allocate far greater resources to schools in the center city uh, than are pri presently allocated to schools, to white schools in the suburbs. And even if we could surmount the political problems involved in the commitment of such large and unequal expenditures, it should be recognized that we're not talking in terms of short-term solutions. The thousands of teachers who are needed, the retraining of teachers, the development of new curricula, and all that that implies is not going, can, could not happen overnight, <coughs> even if we were to start today. Now, I'm not trying to suggest uh, that uh, that we should be abandoning the effort to achieve real reform in the public school systems uh, through all of the things that we've been discussing because they are all key elements in, in change. I don't want to be as guilty as some of the people who have been taking the all-out compensatory education position of uh, polarizing the issues in that way. And the Commission has, has said in this report and other, on other occasions that what we're talking about and what we need is a total program. Uh, but what I am saying is that uh, the notion that we should put all our chips on compensatory education as the, quote, politically feasible uh, solution is just one that will not stand up. Now, apart from the political issue, the, I think the question remains, and it's the key question, whether compensatory edu education in segregated schools is a desirable policy goal to pursue, and whether it will contribute significantly to establishing equal justice and equal opportunity in this country, uh, whether it's a means for bettering the sad state of race relations in this country today. I think the answers to these questions are no for several reasons. First of all, as many know, segregation in northern cities is not just an accident of fate any more than it is in the South. Uh, Negro children do not re reside in ghettos as the result of a, uh, an exercise of free choice. Their attendance in segregated schools uh, is not unconnected with the deliberate segregation and other forms of discrimination. Uh, segregation in housing uh, has been imposed by a variety of policies consciously pursued by public and private agencies. Uh, it's been caused by racially restrictive zoning ordinances and covenants, by discriminatory practices in the private housing industry, by housing and planning decisions of state and local government, by the policies and practices of school boards and superintendents. And so Negro children who believe that they uh, and their schools are stigmatized have a realistic view of their situation. And the reality is not going to change uh, simply by improving segregated schools. A uh, few of those who are arguing the compensatory education uh, position uh, would argue that it's, it's uh, possible to achieve true equality of opportunity in the South without desegregation. And in some cases, at least, I find it a little curious that, in essence, what they're doing is arguing for separate but equal in the North. Moreover, I think that we, uh, apart from the, from the academic findings, you can't look upon equal opportunity uh, without assessing its practical, uh, the practical impact of segregated schools uh, upon children. One of the important functions of the public schools is to provide entry into the world of, uh, of employment. Access to good jobs and to career opportunities, as we all know, depends on a, an informal network of contacts and, co and connections. And the student in a segregated environment, in a segregated system, has difficulty developing these contacts. And this is something that you don't easily <coughs> overcome uh, just by reversing, uh, uh, dealing with the problem of improper counseling and getting good counselors into the school. 
And lastly, the, I think the advocates of compensatory education haven't confronted the issue of how we're going to deal with the state of race relations in this country without beginning to attack the walls that separate us. Uh, we found something which was not terribly surprising in doing this report. Uh, a survey was done for us, and it suggested uh, that uh, when children, when white children who attend uh, uh, racially isolated schools grow up in a segregated environment and become adults, they're more likely than other children, uh, other white children, to have prejudices, feelings of fear and distrust of Negroes and, and to avoid associations with them. Uh, I think in, that may, may be something which should add, should add a, a little additional aspect to the, to the uh, title of this conference, Equal o Educational Opportunity for the Other America, because I think what we're talking about here is not just opportunity for <coughs> minority children, what we're talking about is opportunity for advantaged white children, the opportunity to grow up as self-reliant people, uh, to be aware of the world that they live in, and not to be dependent for their self-esteem on, on false notions of, uh, of racial or social superiority. Negro children who grow, grow up in this segregated environment are likely to have the same kinds of attitudes of fear and distrust about white people. Uh, in summing up in this report, one of our commissioners, Mrs. Frankie Freeman, uh, put it in terms that I think are not too drastic, simply that we're on a collision course now, which may be produced within our society two alienated and unequal nations confronting each other across a widening gulf created by a dual educational system based on income and race. And we don't really need to look beyond the, the events of last summer. Uh, to, to see the truth of, of this observation. In the face of this, all that one of our uh, advocates uh, of compensatory education has been able to suggest is that we, we ought to follow a pattern established in entertainment and sports. Uh, the acceptance of Negro children and consequent progress would be made uh, one by one by a few examples of conspicuous uh, uh, achievement and success. First of all, the implication of this, I think, is wrong and even insulting uh, to suggest that, uh, that that is what we lack uh, in our society. But even if it were true that we lack the, the PhD counterparts of uh, Joe Lewis and Jackie Robinson, the strategy proposed ought to be repugnant to anybody who cares about, about justice because what's being said is that we need to con confine or consign another generation of children to the schools while one by one uh, people break out of the system. Well, if better ghetto education is not going to provide all of the answers or the most promising <coughs> road, uh, the question remains whether integration is visionary, is impractical. And the line here that's been taken, more or less, is that uh, essentially would we, what we need to do is point to the problems of Washington, D.C., or point to the problems of New York City as typical of the rest of the country, uh, and blithely ignore the rest of the nation. Well, in fact, integration of the schools can be and is being accomplished quickly and without a major uh, reallocation of resources in many smaller cities and suburban communities in the country. Uh, it's taken place uh, most recently in uh, Evanston, Illinois, in White Plains, in Teaneck, and uh, under the leadership of uh, uh, Neil Sullivan uh, in Berkeley, California. And it's simply ma there, in terms of techniques, uh, a matter of reorganizing and enlarging attendance areas. Uh, in almost all cases, you've had a careful effort to maintain educational standards for all children. <coughs> And in almost all cases, the, the result has been regarded by the community as, as generally successful. Now, clearly, when you get to the big cities, you're talking about a much more difficult problem in terms of technique. What you're necessarily talking about are larger schools which serve larger numbers of, of students. And in many instances, uh, because of, of the simple demographic facts and the rate at which uh, 
uh, segregation is growing in the cities and the rate at which the school systems are becoming predominantly <coughs> Negro. You're talking about cooperative arrangements of one kind or another uh, through uh, with suburban school districts. Uh, and so this gets you immediately into the question of the political specters that are raised by the, by the question of busing. But increasingly, we've been hearing from educators, education leaders who are beginning to come to grips with this. They're suggesting, and I think it is true, that good urban education over the next years is going to require larger schools where it's going to be possible to bring together the resources that you need and that can't be feasibly located in the small uh, unit in the neighborhood. Uh, they are uh, recognizing that in such schools it may be possible to give more attention, not less attention, to the individual needs of students. They're recognizing that, uh, that such units may be better places to work with uh, uh, with techniques that get away from ability grouping that establish uh, non-graded non classrooms and team teaching. And they're also aware, of course, that, that the issue is uh, that uh, there are about 15 million children in this country who already ride the buses uh, uh, to uh, public schools, forgetting about private schools for a moment. Uh, that the issue is not, and I don't think ever has been, busing uh, per se but what's, what's at the end of the bus ride? Well, the good education is available at the end of the bus ride. And in a number of the larger cities, uh, most notably uh, Pittsburgh and, uh, and Syracuse, although other cities are in the planning stage, the plans are being made for new facilities, which would be larger facilities in which, in the judgment of the people there, would serve the, to improve the quality of education for all children. Nor is it, I think, necessary to just sit by while these longer-range plans are being made for new facilities. In a few communities in Boston, in uh, Hartford, in Rochester, uh, hundreds of children from the inner city are now enrolled in suburban schools. Uh, pursuant to plans that have been developed by private groups with the cooperations of the school systems uh, involved. Uh, these plans or these programs, again, seem to be going well, and I do not see any reason why they shouldn't be instituted in New York, in Washington, in Chicago, or in Los Angeles, uh, while the broader solutions, the solutions that are going to take more time, are being developed. I think they have a significance that goes beyond the small numbers of children involved, because it is tokenism at the beginning because they begin to break down <coughs> attitudes of, of, uh, that come from separation. They begin to dispel the fears and the, and the misconceptions that uh, are the main barriers to progress. Now, I'm not trying to say with all of this that it's all going to be easy, or indeed that the job uh, is going to be done once the schools are physically uh, desegregated, because the, uh, the attitudes and the, and the problems that have existed over a period of years go well beyond that. Uh, but I do think that it is a problem not of the resources or of the techniques, but of the will and the commitment. And I think that nobody's really serving uh, the solutions of this problem by saying that we need to evade it or postpone it or look for uh, easy ways out, way out or talk about more of the same in terms of, the, of uh, what we're trying to do with the, with the schools. I think in political terms that uh, over the next few years, uh, at some point which, uh, which uh, nobody can quite fix in time right now, uh, we're going to face in Congress the issue of a major program of public assistance uh, to school construction throughout the country. And when Congress faces this decision, uh, it's going either to provide for the kinds of schools uh, that will ratify separate and unequal uh, and will entrench segregation in our cities for the next 50 years, or else it's going to do something else and provide for full and equal participation in our society. I think the key question between now and then is whether enough communities and enough people 
uh, develop solutions that will make politically feasible and politically uh, possible in, in communities around the nation the kinds of pressure that would lead Congress to a decision which would not entrench segregation for the next 50 or 100 years. And that's, that, I think, is, is the real issue, whether individuals and communities are prepared to face up to these questions now, and that, that, will, that I think, will determine in the long run where we will come out. Thank you very much. Of the uh, UCLA Law School faculty, uh, and it is, it is my job, uh, as quickly as possible, to put our various panels before you and then simply get out of the way so they can uh, get on with their business. At some point, with respect to each panel, I will step in and uh, so that we can turn uh, to having participation of everyone uh, in the room uh, uh, in the form of questions to whoever is on the platform at a particular time. I shall introduce to you uh, all of the uh, members of the first panel uh, before uh, we begin with the presentations. First to my right is Professor Arnold Kaufman, uh, who is a member of the faculty of the University of Michigan in the uh, philosophy department. He is a visiting professor of philosophy uh, this quarter and next quarter at UCLA. Uh, professor Kaufman has his uh, doctorate from Columbia University and he has been a visiting professor at Tuskegee Institute uh, and at Harvard. He has long been active in the civil rights movement, uh, is chairman of the Conference for the Democratic Left. He has just published uh, a book called The Radical Liberal, New Man in American Politics. Uh, the panelists, uh, starting uh, to your extreme right, Douglas Hobbs, uh, Assistant Professor of Political Science at UCLA. Uh, Professor Hobbs uh, has his undergraduate and graduate degrees uh, from Harvard, uh, his PhD in 1966 in political science. He has published in the field of California governmental processes, and he's been a member of the UCLA faculty since 1965. Uh, in the middle of uh, our panel, uh, Paul Jacobs, uh, writer and social critic is the best way to describe uh, him, and his degree is HSG, uh, high school graduate. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Jacobs uh, is identified for you in the program uh, as a member of the staff of the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions uh, at Santa Barbara and a member of the staff for the Center of the Study of Law and Society uh, at the University of California at Berkeley. I might also add here something that is not in the program. He has occasionally identified himself as the director of the Center for the Study of Centers, Nirvana, California. <laughs> He has been a consultant to the Peace Corps. He was a consultant to the President's Task Force on the War Against Poverty. Uh, you undoubtedly know his writings in too many uh, periodicals to mention. Uh, his most recent um, books have been The State of the Unions in 1965, a political autobiography is Curly Jewish, 1965, and most recently published uh, his book about Los Angeles, Prelude to Riot, A View of Urban America uh, from the Bottom. Uh, one of his professional associations is that he is a member of the Tattoo Club of America, uh, which prompted a colleague of mine to comment that that must mean that he knows how to play the bugle very well. Our third panelist is Richard Wasserstrom, a professor of law and philosophy at the UCLA Law School. Professor Wasserstrom has his uh, philosophy uh, degree from the University of Michigan and his law degree uh, from Stanford. He was on the Stanford faculty uh, until 1963. He was an attorney in the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice for a year. And from 1964 to 67, he was dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Tuskegee Institute. Uh, he joined the UCLA faculty in uh, law school faculty in 1967. I give you now Professor Arnold Kaufman. Thank you, Professor Horowitz, fellow oh, panelists. Uh, one of the glories of philosophy is that uh, it's our function as philosophers to detach ourselves from that which is politically feasible so as to try to 
reordered framework within which men uh, find it convenient to be realistic <coughs> to the extent that philosophy bakes bread. I'm going to talk about equal opportunity, equal educational opportunity, um, um, with particular concern to uh, uh, explore the theoretical bases for uh, equal opportunity and to specify perhaps a little more clearly than is usually done uh, what constitutes equal opportunity because I have grave doubts about what is called equal educational opportunity in the United States today. The uh, American commitment to equal opportunity finds its principal social and political expression in education. Uh, compulsory early education plus strenuous efforts to induce uh, students not to drop out before they finish high school plus a vast expansion of higher education has come for many Americans uh, to be the principal route by which the country is going to work out the problems to most of its chronic and hopefully remediable social ills, social problems. That once we have genuinely equal educational opportunity, it's, it's sometimes argued, uh, we will have done the principal thing that needs to be done to create a truly just society. However, conceptions of genuinely equal educational opportunity tend to vary very much within the population. The view that I think is most widely held is that individuals ought to be treated equally. And that is, they ought to be given access to the best in our system without regard to race, creed, color, ethnic background, or previous condition of servitude. Now, <clears throat> and, 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 and in a sense, this is a very formal notion of uh, being treated equally because once they're in the system, then they have to um, go through a process of being compared, uh, increasingly so as they approach uh, the university and have to go through a process of competing for the increasingly scarce uh, resources of the educational system. Now note that this whole conception of equal educational opportunity presupposes that our educational resources are scarce and that they of necessity will remain so for the foreseeable future. Uh, correlatively, it presupposes that there must be a competition, that is a, a competition for access to these scarce resources. Our very conception, the, the, the most widely held conception of equal educational opportunity presupposes scarce resources and a competition for uh, access to them. Uh, schooling is compulsory in its early stages, but as one advances, one is increasingly subjected to fierce competitive struggle for access to the best schools and ultimately for access to the resources of colleges and universities uh, where it's generally taken for granted uh, only a portion, a subset of the whole student population can reasonably be expected to go. Now I want to argue that the conception of equal educational opportunity that I've just sketched in is morally defective. For uh, implicit in it is an idea of a fair competitive struggle which does not withstand a moment's uh, serious moral examination. That is, I'm setting up what may be for most of you here a straw man because I doubt that anyone here uh, actually accepts the notion of equal educational opportunity as I've just outlined it, but I think it's important for me to do so because I want to build on it and, and uh, make a few points. Um, I'd like to read a passage that's quoted by our Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare in his book, Excellence, uh, a passage he quotes from an early uh, mine investigation commission in England and it, it, he quotes it, in the course of discussing individual performance as the sole criterion of educational status and advancement, and he wants to make the point through this quote that surely it's a defective notion of equal educational opportunity which takes individual performance 
without regard to what has happened to the student beforehand as the sole criterion. He writes, I'm, I'm sorry, the quote from the commission report follows. I am Sarah Gooder, uh, this was written in 1842. I am Sarah Gooder, I am eight years old, I'm a coal carrier in the Gauber mine. It does not tire me, but I have to trap without a light and I'm scared. I go at four and sometimes half past three in the morning and come out at five and half past in the evening. I never go to sleep. Sometimes I've s I sing when I've light, but not in the dark. I dare not sing then. I don't like being in the pit. I'm very sleepy when I go in the morning. I go to Sunday school and learn to read. They teach me to pray. I have heard tell of Jesus many a time. I don't know why he came on earth. I don't know why he died, but he had stones for his head to rest on. End quote. Now, that's a horror story, and he means it as a horror story of what happens, what happened to children during the Industrial uh, Revolution. And the point he's making is that equal educational opportunity on the model that I've just described is meaningless for the Sarah Good Gooders of the world. It's quite evident that she would have to be an intellectual star, star at a huge... Uh, magnitude of brightness to overcome the conditions of her early life and to tell her that she can compete on an equal basis with those who uh, do not suffer what is what is described in that passage is obviously absurd and morally uh, defective now though this is plain enough in the case of uh, sarah gooder it seems not to be so plain when many ma many americans think about our black fellow citizens and let me give an illustration of another horror story, which is out of my own personal experience why, while teaching uh, under the tutelage of the former dean of Tuskegee Institute at uh, Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, Dick Wasserstrom. I had a student in this class I was in. I'll call her Ruth, though that's not her real name. She came from a small rural Alabama community. Uh, Ruth had uh, never uh, in her early schooling or very rarely been called on to write any essays. Uh, her uh, her uh, technical mastery of uh, composition, of English sentence structure and so on, left uh, very much to be desired. Uh, once while I was discussing Animal Farm, I mentioned in the course of the discussion the Bolshevik Revolution. After class, she came up to me. And she asked me, uh, Mr. Kaufman, you mentioned the Bolshevik Revolution. Now, I have no idea what that is. I've never heard of it. She was a freshman in college, you see. I've never heard of the Bolshevik Revolution. Could you tell me what it is you're talking about? Um, she had almost no mathematical skills, her formal mathematical training having been so seriously uh, defective. In spite of all of these handicaps, I had ample reason to believe that Ruth was a person who had plenty of talent. Now, I won't go into the evidence, but I, she had plenty of talent. She was an extraordinarily bright girl. I'd like to just say I'm using the term talent here in a somewhat technical way. I want to make a distinction between what we uh, uh, somehow constitutionally acquire, the, the, the uh, potentialities for learning which are part of our biological inheritance, and what we uh, acquire subsequently by way of abilities, and for purposes of making that distinction, I'm going to distinguish between talent and skill. A skill is something someone acquires as a result of some experience, whereas the talents are that original constitutionally or biologically uh, 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 constituted range of potentialities a person has. Now, obviously, Ruth. Uh, who I have good reason to believe had many talents, had few skills. And certainly, in, in a sense relevant to the competitive struggle for scarce economic resources and for the prizes and grades that one competes for in an educational system, she was seriously underprivileged. And f the technical word I'm going to use here for such people, because I think, uh, as I'll explain later, I think the American people are culturally underprivileged, I want to distinguish between that and technical underprivilege of the sort that I'm describing, so I'll call her a technically underprivileged person. But the story that I want principally to tell you about, Ruth, is this one. One day she handed me an essay, and in this essay, uh, Ruth said two things at different points. At the beginning, she said, 
the Negro people in the United States are seriously uh, discriminated against, oppressed. Later on in the essay, she said, but the, uh, she said uh, in passing, uh, the Negroes in the United States get everything they deserve. And we had an interview on, in which I discussed her essay with her. And I said, how could you say this? Ruth? How could you say the Negroes in the United States are seriously discriminated against? And then later on, uh, say, uh, but the Negroes get everything they deserve. And we went around that, and she hemmed and hawed. And finally it came out, and it came out in just this way. She said, but Negroes in the United States are inferior. Oh, Negroes are inferior, not Negroes in the United States. Uh, I said, you know, what my reaction was. I said, what, what are you talking about? This is baloney. Whoever told you such a thing? She said, well, my parents have told me this all my life. Uh, and it's very hard to reject the teaching of your parents. What I'm trying to... Uh, this is a horror story. Um, I, incidentally, I might add in passing, I once told this story to the son-in-law of a prominent uh, American politician, in fact, a presidential candidate, and when I got to the part in which Ruth says, but Negroes are inferior, his reaction was quickly interrupt me and say, but that's not so, which I think suggests the dimensions of our problem. Um, well, in any event, in her case, in her case, equal opportunity is almost meaningless in the sense that I've defined it. Consider the disability she starts with. She lacked the requisite technical skills. She lacked the requisite background of general information. The rules that governed her earlier education were not fair or equitable, especially in Alabama, but in more generally in the United States, the educational tests that we put students through are virtually designed to favor the offspring of white middle-class families, fairly affluent families. Um, and she, um, she uh, in her special case was a part of a system in Alabama that was administered by officials who were clearly and transparently not impartial, uh, not uh, equitable in their allocation, whatever there is to allocate in such a system. But above all, and this is what I want to stress in this connection, I think it goes to some of the problems Mr. Taylor perhaps uh, didn't deal with as squarely as I would like to see the government deal with this problem, but above all, this, this young lady lack self-esteem. She regarded herself as an inferior person. And the whole system in which she was embedded and had her being had shattered from her birth uh, any self-confidence she might have acquired, any sense of self-esteem. Um, the circumstance of her life in a small Alabama rural community, the circumstances of her parents' life were such that this young lady had seldom been treated with respect, had been seldom encouraged to view herself as equal in value, as, uh, as estimable as other individuals in our society. The point is, compete perhaps she could, but on a basis that was grossly unfair, and not because all the technical, not only because of all the, the, the technical cards were stacked against her, but because a person lacking in this degree in self-confidence and self-esteem simply lacks the motive to uh, compete effectively in such a system. Now, of course, I, I, I tell this story because I regard Ruth as a representative person. There are millions of black youngsters like Ruth in the rural South, and the same is true in the urban ghettos of the North and the South, and I entirely agree with this quotation, which I've taken from the book Black Power by Stokely Carmichael and uh, Charles Hamilton. Uh, quote, there can be no doubt that in today's world a thorough and comprehensive education is an absolute necessity. Yet it is obvious from the data that a not even minimum education is being received in most ghetto schools, and I think some of the data reported, uh, referred to by Mr. Taylor this morning, amply bears out uh, this claim. So that, <clears throat> what I want to stress here is that the situation of America's black youngsters and black citizens generally is absolutely special with respect to this problem. 
See, Ruth's parents and her parents' parents and their parents, going back three and a half centuries, had been subjected to a system of slavery and serfdom and servility and deference and inferiority, which is absolutely unique insofar as it applies to a whole social group within our culture. It's not like other immigrant groups most of whom came here as an act of certain kind of courage. They'd already selected themselves out as special in precisely the respects which had been destroyed in persons like Ruth. Now, if you want to understand why there is conflagration in the ghettos, I suggest that we should stop thinking so much. I mean, it's terribly important that people be employed and so on. But we stop thinking exclusively about unemployment for a moment and think of what it will be like when Ruth realizes that the system into which she was born, has done what I have described to her, to her spiritual life, if you will, has given her the self-image that I've described of herself. Suppose, as she inevitably will, find, she finds out what's been done to her, consider the amount of frustration and anger that will be generated in consequence of that alone, without regard to the material uh, disabilities and others suffer. Now, a theory of equal educational opportunity based on the competitive model must at least require fair competition. And what would that mean in the case of someone? It would mean that the United States would, at the very minimum, have to make restitution to all the roots for what has been done to them by essentially white society. It's the only way it makes any sense to talk about it in corporate terms. The society has to make restitution to the roots for what has been done to them by this society. Whatever justice there may be in a retributive theory of punishment, I think there is certainly justice in a retributive theory of restitution. I most acknowledge that the Germans, as a nation, had special obligations to Euro European Jews as a people for what was done to them over a short space of time. And for the life of me, I cannot see that there is much moral difference between what has been done to America's black people over a period of three or three and a half centuries and what was done to the Jews over a brief period in European history. For myself, I would prefer the gas chamber to the kind of spiritual bondage which has existed and continues exist to exist for a very great part perhaps the predominant part, of black Americans. Now, under conditions in which uh, no one is technically disadvantaged, or disadvantaged in spirit, as I've tried to describe it, uh, fair competition would require equitable rules impartially applied. But that won't do for Ruth or the Ruths of the land. Um, indeed, uh, simply providing equitable rules impartially applied in the case of Ruth would uh, actually probably be quite harmful for in com the competitive situation, given the d disabilities I've described, she would certainly, almost certainly fail. And thus, the fact of objective failure would be, would reinforce her sense, already intense sense, of personal inferiority. Rather, the roots must be given an opportunity to achieve equality in those respects that make for competitive success in our educational system. And this means, and here I spell out roughly what I have in mind by restitution, but I can't do it in much detail, this means that the rules must be sensibly weighted in her favor. The rules must be sensibly weighted in her favor. There must be sensitively partial administration of those rules, application of them, restitutive application of those rules. Um, now, what I mean by sensitively applied here, let me give you another illustration of what I don't mean, and I think it'll suggest what I do have in mind. The uh, uh, University of Michigan Law School recently started a compensatory program in which they brought people who would not normally, Negroes who would not normally be admissible to the law school. And then they put these young youngsters in, uh, unlike any of the other entering students in the school, 
uh, who had to room together, they gave them private rooms, you see, to be very special in their favor. Well, this was a disaster. That's not the sort of thing. I won't go into why it was a disaster. They were warned, but it turned out to be a disaster. That's not what I mean. Uh, so I stress sensitively partial administration, but I won't try to spell it out here. Third, even greater access to resources must be given to such students than others. Um, that is, there must be compensatory education, special programs, so on, but I'd like to suggest that it shouldn't just be remediable, remedial. It should be integrated in a general, sensible <coughs> educational program for individuals at that stage of their human development, and I'll come back to this. Perhaps others will talk about it, too. And fourth, as between two individuals competing for scarce educational resources, one who does relatively well uh, by absolute standards, that is, take two individuals, one who by absolute standards does much better than the second, but who is not really making much progress in the education because they already come uh, tremendously advantaged, uh, whereas the second, who does relatively inferior work in absolute terms, but is making vast progress in terms of the, uh, of the capacities, the skills that they bring initially, that if a choice has to be made about who should be excluded from education, it should clearly be the first and not the second. As if someone has to be excluded, it should be the person who is not making the best use of the skills they bring to the program in the first place. In short, equal opportunity in the sense of equal treatment without regard to race, creed, color, ethnic background, or pre previous condition of servitude is morally outrageous. Um, it's merely a form of idealism that tranquilizes our moral sensibilities, which enables us to ignore the real predicament that the roots of the land are in. Previous condition of servitude makes all the difference in the world in determining uh, a person's access to, uh, to uh, scarce educational resources. Uh, previous condition of servitude uh, must be very importantly brought into the picture in determining what constitutes fair competition for prizes and scarce educational resources. Uh, in 19th century Britain, many privileged Englishmen were able to cope with the Sarah Gooders by devising an elaborate system of rhetorical tranquilizers and institutional filters that made unfreedom freedom. Freedom became child labor. Uh, injustice uh, became a form of justice under the laissez-faire conceptions that were prevalent. Today, I think Americans do the same thing with the idea of equality functions as an institutional tranquilizer, um, which uh, prevents us from seeing in its full fullness the, the, the gross injustice of a system based on a kind of formal ideal of equal opportunity. Now up to this point, I haven't, uh, I haven't tried to question the basic competitive model of equal opportunity as it functions ideally. That is to say, up to this point, I've just been trying to indicate how an educational process, which is essentially competitive in nature, uh, can be made to function fairly. If that's the kind of educational process that we want or have, then it seems to me that it should at least function fairly, and I've tried to indicate the conditions under which it will be fair. Now I want to question the whole idea that our educational processes should embody a competitive principle at all. And I want to question such a notion of equal educational opportunity as presupposing the competition among students for grades, for prizes, for scarce educational resources on two grounds. First of all, um, I want to argue that, as presently constituted, this competition is primarily directed to 
uh, enabling people to gain access to higher education and, if possible, to the most prestigious institutions of higher education. And it seems to me, underlying this notion, uh, underlying this whole apparatus by which people, our youngsters, fight their way to a decent higher education or to higher education at all, is the notion that higher education is a privilege rather than a right. I think, indeed, Mr. Gardner, in his book on excellence, uh, explicitly argues that higher education should be treated as a kind of privilege rather than a right. Against this, I should like to argue that higher education is a fundamental human right and that it shouldn't be made, access to higher education should not be made contingent on a competitive performance. Um, secondly, I want to argue that competition is inimical to what I would regard as the central aims of educational process. It's inimical to these central way, uh, aims of, an, of, a, of education in ways that undermine commitment to human equality in its deepest and most significant sense. Now, society acknowledges the right to education up to a point. That is, in the early phases, we do acknowledge the right to education and provide public education. But, as I've suggested, tends to treat higher education as a privilege. Yet I think a presumption in favor of a right to higher education exists because, and I can't spell it out in detail, typically a higher education is necessary for that growth of personal powers without which we can't develop ourselves fully, without which we can't realize ourselves as human beings in a human way. And it's also, I think, a necessary condition of responsible citizen, citizenship in a society like ours, which is supposed to encourage responsible citizenship, um, but as I think generally kills responsibility. Um, now, it seems to me that there is no scarcity of resources in the United States with respect to cashing this right that everyone has. No scarcity of resources. A society that is approaching the trillion dollar gross national product, that is able to afford incredible amounts of money for cosmetics and liquor and cigarettes and what some regard as a questionable war and so on, is able to, uh, the, 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 the uh, sum of 100 uh, billion to 160 billion may be practically unfeasible, but economically, over a 10 year period, but economically it's well within the capacity of American society to provide sums of that order of magnitude and more for a function as vital as education, if the national will to do it existed. I can't see that there's much to choose here between the national will to avoid integration of our schools and the national will to avoid allocating, allocating scarce resources at that level of commitment. So we have sufficient resources to cash this right to an equal education at the highest levels. Uh, and finally, the competition for grades, the, the very process of competition for grades, for prizes, for a place in the system of higher education seems to me to be intrinsically harmful to the main aim of schooling, which I believe to be not uh, just equalizing the society, but training people in how to live and examine life. That seems to me to be absolutely crucial to responsible citizenship and to the fullest development of one's human powers. It's essential to personal growth because I don't think ultimately a person can typically develop his powers as fully as he might without acquiring the capacity for self-examination. That's a part of the growth, growth process. The power of self-examination, of critical self-examination, to discover oneself, to discover one's weaknesses, one's strengths, one's prejudices, and so on. Uh, it's also clearly a condition of responsible citizenship. That is to say, the capacity to intelligently and responsibly examine society is the fundamental skill of a free man in a free society. Uh, something apparently uh, which is lost in the recent exchange between Max Rafferty and, Pre and uh, uh, President Hitch of the University of California 
Uh, I do agree completely with Rafferty's claim that the universities must be better than the rest of society. I think he's absolutely right in that. But the man has little notion of what being better requires. It's not being more law-abiding, more reverent, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and so on. In short, it's not being more compliant. It's rather being more irreverent, more critical of the conventional wisdom, less compliant, more intelligent and responsible in the fullest sense of citizenship in a society, in the manner of Socrates rather than in the manner of the Rand Corporation, or if you will, in the manner of Eartha Kitt and Dale Noy Jr., the captain who is now being court-martialed for refusing to give training against his conscience in the Air Force, which I feel especially about because he was a student of mine at the University of Michigan. Now this non-competitive model, why this non-competitive model that I'm beginning to sketch out, this non-competitive model of an educational process, uh, why do I believe this to express a deeper concession, a conception of human equality than that implicit in the competitive model of a higher education? Because in its deepest sense, it seems to me the equality of all human beings is an elliptical way of referring to our obligation to treat each human being with respect. And an essential part of treating a human being with respect is to treat each as capable of carving out his individual career according to his own reason choices. And such a capacity to carve out one's own individual career according to his own re reason choices requires that man achieve that kind of dignity of the thinking being, to use a fr uh, phrase that's in uh, John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, the dignity of a thinking being, which Socrates was also concerned to inculcate, that is crucial to the living of an examined life. <coughs> now, I have to encapsulate this because my time is short, uh, but I hope the general thrust of, 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 of uh, the, the the difference in the general thrust of this moral emphasis is clear to this audience. And until, I would like to say also that until and unless men are started, individuals are started decisively down this road to an examined life, he has not been truly educated, and that is so even if he is trained to be a competent slot filler in our society. Most engineers are not really educated men when they get their degree. Most, well, I won't, I won't come any closer. <laughs> Draw your own conclusions of how, as to how far I would go. Um, now, on the other hand, I'm not arguing that education is the main condition of personal salvation. I think some people, people like Paul Goodman and uh, uh, Edgar Friedenberg, tend to view it as a condition of personal salvation because, so to speak, religion has failed and affluence has failed in our society. And now education is the only thing that seems to be left. But it can't carry the whole burden <coughs> of personal salvation. Other things has to, have to figure, uh, but it, 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 it plays a very essential part in the process of achieving a personal salvation, that part which I try to express in terms of emphasis on living the examined life. Now, what are the remedy, the remedies to the failures of American education? And I haven't spelled them out in detail, but they should be implicit what, what I've said, if what I said has moral basis. What are the remedies? Now, I don't have time to sketch out an, an alternative process of education in any detail, but I should think that any remedy would involve the principally the abandonment of all the, the whole competitive apparatus over time. And that would mean the abandonment of the competitive grading system, the abandonment of prevailing instruments for sorting students out and streaming them, most of which I've already indicated favor the white middle class student from a certain kind of superficial cultural background. It, it would involve the restoration of integration in, in, in learning, and here by integration I mean the integration of disciplinary, uh, of, of, of subject matters in ways that overcome the, the, the prevailing and irrational disciplinary divisions which are bureaucratic outgrowths of the growth of departments. 
it would involve a fundamental reordering of the uh, priorities of American higher education. Now the priorities run roughly uh, research, graduate education, undergraduate education, and within undergraduate education, the most talented and those most skilled and then the least talented and those least skilled. Uh, it would reverse that whole order of priority. It would mean more teachers per students. It would mean much greater flexibility in the use of time and space in our schools than is presently the case. And it would also mean fuller student participation in, the govern in governing the life of their school communities from the very beginning. I'm not talking about student power, but that, that kind of, of reasonable participation by students in governing the life of their communities, including their school communities, which is the indispensable, another indispensable condition of, of responsible citizenship in such a society in, long, in the long run. In short, it would make making the fundamental criterion of the quality of an, 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 an educational institution, the, it would ma mean making the fundamental criterion of the quality of educational institutions, the quality of its educational process, or rather than its, it, it, its standards of, of admission or, or the, the, the standards of grading and so on. It would mean providing a milieu which nourishes the mind and spirit so as to take people from where they happen to be to where they can be and should be, even if where they happen to be when they start is very low down on the totem pole. Now, one final point in this connection. I, I think a surprising convergence emerges from from the account I've just given. Because I think the conditions of justice in education converge with the conditions of excellence in education. That is, the very conditions which would be such as to treat what I've called the technically underprivileged with justice are also the conditions required to improve the quality of education from the ground up, but especially in higher education. Uh, for in both cases, the key to the maintenance of high standards of education involves the abandonment of the competitive process, uh, uh, the key to the maintenance of high standards of the education of the technically underprivileged and the technically privileged involves the abandonment of the competitive processes of uh, American education involves the abandonment of the necessity of teachers constantly to be in the <coughs> being in the position of imposing uniform standards unequally because of the technical underprivilege of some to whom these uniform standards are employed. Hence, it's my belief that the current approach to admission policies can safely be abandoned, provided resources ample to the task of promoting true excellence in education can be secure. Now, obviously, that's a big proviso. But what I'm saying is that as an ideal aim of education, we should seek to achieve a true integration of our educational system from the ground up, and especially in our colleges and universities. And that would mean an integration of people on the base of race, social class, and the level of skills which they have uh, as a result of whatever early life experience they had. In conclusion, let me anticipate the standard American as apple pie objection to what I've said, and that is it's not practical, it's not realistic. Now is there a realistic possibility that the society would be willing to chance all the subversion implicit in pursuing the Socratic ideal? Is there a reasonable chance that it would be likely to reallocate social resources in the amounts required? Is, it, is there a reasonable possibility, a realistic possibility, that the society would be willing to treat people as equals in the deeper sense I've tried to articulate, rather than equally in the, super in the superficial sense as I've described? Well, I, I must confess, prospects are dim. And uh, that's because we are a morally underdeveloped people and hence a culturally deprived people. 
Any morally sensitive individual who had any doubts about that had them laid to rest when the crescendo of cheers that greeted Johnson's remarks about crime in the streets had died down. I believe I detected some rebel yells there. Um, it's become fashionable to oppose crime in the streets. This has become another institutional filter, tranquilizers by which we can reconfirm our commitment to traditional and con conventional American ways. It may yet become the excuse for a genocidal repression of a people who have ample reason to be in disorder and rebellion. However, it's not just the known nothings that we must be in, have, that we have to contend with here. It's also what I call the privately virtuous men who make the kind of indifferent, morally bland society we have, the morally underdeveloped society we have possible. It's also, I'm afraid, the bourgeois revolutionaries, those radicals of the leisured class who practice uh, revolutionary rhetoric and posture uh, in, and at, at the expense of a pursuit, effective pursuit of radical goals. Um, we have the means, I've suggested, to pursue a true and genuine equality of educational opportunity in our society. We lack the genuine moral concern, hence we lack the national will to do so. But it does seem to me that there is an intimate connection between the will to struggle for such things and success, even if the success is only partial. And I want to end on a somewhat more optimistic note than those that immediately preceded by quoting from one of my favorite social philosophers, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who expresses an impulse that I find also in the writings of men like William James and that has made America, in some respects at least, very special in the world. I quote from Rousseau, The limits of possibility in moral things are not so confined as many are apt to suppose them. It is our weakness, our vice, and our prejudice that narrow the circle. Vile slaves reply with a sneer of contempt when we talk of liberty. I would add only that lack of political intelligence is an important vice, and that vile slaves also reply with a sneer of contempt and perhaps the smirk of the realistic man when we talk of genuine educational equality. Thank you very much. We will run this session until 12.30, and I'll turn first at the end of the table to Professor Hobbs, and if you gentlemen will just take it from here. Uh, I, I might add, uh, we've asked Mr. Taylor to join the group, and he is uh, entitled now to participate with you. Now, <coughs> we've reversed the order that's in the program, and we've decided that the, the order in which we're going to speak is that those with the least hair will speak first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, recently, a, uh, a, a Soviet scientist uh, who wanted to change his job, which was a fairly dull job uh, in a food plant, uh, applied for a job in a rather sensitive uh, area of, uh, uh, involved with the security program of the Soviet uh, society. And uh, he got a questionnaire which he had to fill out. And he, one of the questions on the questionnaire was, do you have any relatives living overseas? Uh, he answered no, and uh, continued with the rest of the questionnaire. Uh, a few weeks later, an agent of the, I guess you'd call it the SBI, uh, came to see him and said, uh, you filled this questionnaire out? I said, yes. He said, you answered this question, do you have any relatives living overseas? You wrote down no. So the scientist said, that's right. And uh, the, scientist, the SBI man said, now, we happen to know that you have a brother who lives in Israel and that you correspond regularly with him. That's right, said the scientist. Well, said the SBI man, how could you answer that question? Do you have any relatives living overseas no, when you admit that you have a brother living in Israel and you correspond with him. And the scientist said, uh, my brother doesn't live overseas, I do. <laughs> now, <laughs> I tell you that joke, story, whatever you want to call it, because I want to raise a question with you, which seems to be implicit in what Arnold Kaufman has said, 
And that is, I'd like to know which is the other America to which you refer in your program. Because implicit in that concept of the other America, although Mike Harrington didn't mean it that way when he wrote it that way, is the notion that that other America is somehow an inferior America. And that, therefore, we have to deal with it in that fashion. Now, when, I, when be, one becomes aware of this, one becomes aware equally of another aspect, and that is, how is it possible that in this society, the institutions of government have, in my judgment, in general, become the enemies uh, of those people for whom they were designed. That is, one can take the educational system, along, which wasn't specifically designed to help uh, the black community or the poor minorities of any other group, one can take that one along with those institutions which were specifically designed to help those people not in our America, so to speak. And the general conclusion has to be drawn that they all have become the enemy of that group. Now, how is this possible? Well, I think Arnold has touched on some of the questions, and I would like to suggest that the reason that this has happened is because we all live in the other America, and the reason we all live in the other America is because we have a mythological country. That is, the assumptions on which we have been operating have no basis in reality. And it is because they have no basis in reality that I would like to suggest that Mr. Taylor's thesis about the effects, the potential effects of attending integrated schools is based. I think that that assumption is an incorrect one if we are to deal with the reality of America. That is to say, if one was to create the kind of effect Mr. Taylor wants to have coming from an experience in an integrated school, the school would have to be a totally different kind of school than is envisioned in any plans of, about the schools today. It would, first of all, above all, it would have to be a school that would assume the active role of instantaneously turning the students in the school against the parents. It would have to be a school which would identify for its students